Ah. Hey everybody, Mark Callahan, Mr. Saltwater Tank, coming to you live on location on the dual 1,000 gallon tank build install. I'm here all week. I'm literally here all week, cranking out, getting in this project done here on a Tuesday evening, a little different time than our usual Monday evenings, but I was on a plane yesterday. Uh, unfortunately, flying private um, isn't always an option, so I gotta go and the airlines go, which put me here in the evening. This is the Tuesday, now we'll call it Monday night, happening on Tuesday, so we don't confuse anyone. Monday night Q&A session, I answer your questions, so fire away in the chat if you have a question and I will make sure I will do the best to answer as many as I can uh, in the time that we're rolling tonight. So a couple of things, the questions you all had last time about this project. I'll answer a couple of those to get started. Thanks Rebecca for the shout out. Each of these tanks are 1,000, about 1,000 gallons each. They're eight feet long, four feet front to back, four feet tall and they're run separately they're going to be two separate systems now some of you said why not just do one big tank between the two because each of these tanks is going to be a separate reef tank with separate organisms that have special needs in each therefore each of these get their own filtration for the tank they're not tied together in any way the filtration largely looks the same i'll show you that maybe next week, but it's separate. So these tanks will not interact with one another. The only thing they're going to share is the mixing station and the top off water in the RODI unit. So these systems have their own filtration. Again, filtration is the same, but they're separate. The two tanks will not interact. Keith wants to know, uh, where's my buddy today? Tell you what, Keith, since you asked, let me send him a message and say, the audience is looking for you. <laughs> um, that way he gets in there for those of you that are curious where he is. He didn't disappear. He didn't get eaten by the tank. Um, he's actually in the back doing work as a good worker should be while the boss is out here uh, doing the live stream. All right. So let's see, what else can I tell you about these systems? Ah, lighting. So lighting on these tanks will be Radions, Radion G5 Pros over each tank. I think I have six of them uh, rolling on these systems. Plenty of light to get down to the bottom, even at 48 inches deep. Those Radions will be on a light rack um, to move them up and down. We shouldn't have to get in these tanks. A reef tank is different than the insert tanks that I redid last year in the lobby. We don't have to get in there. It's best to leave a reef tank alone. If you follow me long enough, you hear me talk about that, just leave the tank alone, especially true with reef tanks. We'll have the option to get in these. We have a neat system that I'll show you in the future and how that's gonna get done, but we're not gonna be getting in these tanks um, regularly. Russ wanted to know, um, are these Radions and a T5? All right, Russ, we're gonna start with just Radions. We may add T5s in time, but we're not adding them uh, at the get-go. So, great question, Russ. Thanks for uh, tuning in and asking about that one. The buddy, yes, Keith, um, I sent the buddy a message. Maybe he's on the way in. All right, so what else can I tell you about these tanks? Well, let's see, next week I'll be able to show you a lot more in terms of filtration. Maybe I do the live stream next week from behind. What's behind me and show you guys the filtration because I'm still putting it together now uh, not quite to the point where I can show that off. Everything's separate. We talked about lights. So, oh, lights and then there's flow. Some people say flow is more important than lighting. Some people say lighting is more important than flow. What are we doing for flow on these tanks? Each tank has two closed loop systems and then it will have four MP60s and I think about two MP40s on the back wall. So a good amount of in-tank flow that's going on. With a four foot deep tank, had to get that closed loop in there to get water moving on the bottom. Yeah, I could stack up more MP60s, but with this deep, this wide, these dimensions, I found you just gotta have a closed loop to really move water that I want. So the closed loop, two closed loop systems in each tank, all run by a Biz A200s. Each tank will have two, four, 
uh, four Abyss A200s on it, dual return pumps. I'll talk about why I'm doing that and how I'm doing that in a future show. And then two Abyss A200s on the return pump as well, excuse me, on the closed loop. We're also gonna have a spare A200 in the back. So if something goes down, we pull one, bring it up front uh, and keep things going. All right, Brett wants to know, can you run Trident control dosing with calc rather than two part? I don't see why not, Brett, because the way I run my calc reactors are I'm just pumping in so much uh, RODI water into them per hour. So I don't see why the Trident couldn't man manage that because it's no different than dosing than it is running, um, let's say dosing water into a calc reactor. Uh, I don't see why that couldn't work. Um, let me think about that for a minute. Just want to make sure I'm not misspeaking here. Hmm. Yeah, so Brett, there's no reason that shouldn't work. You're going to give the Trident your kind of upper and lower tolerances, how much you think it should give, and then it'll run from it from there. Certainly keep an eye on it. Look, I have a Trident um, that's running my tank at home. I still spot check that thing once a week. I still log into my Apex Fusion dashboard twice a day just to make sure everything looks good. Yes, I have automation. Yes, the Apex is my eyes and my ears and my first responder for me, especially when I'm on the road. And I still keep an eye on it. Won't hurt. And it's fun to see what your tank is doing, especially when you can log into it from afar and see what's going on. It's pretty cool that we can do that. All right, Keith wants to know, is it better to use, this is in terms of RODI, is it better to use a five micron filter before a one micron filter? The answer to that, Keith, is yes. The five micron will clog up. It'll get to larger particles first. If you put the one micron, then the five, the one micron is gonna clog a lot faster and the five micron essentially is gonna do nothing because any size, any all the particles that would get past one micron would pass right through the five. So you gotta have the five first then the one, you don't want to do a one and a one, it can clog too quickly. Start with the five uh, and then move into the one. Great question, good job on using uh, RODI water. Steve, Steve D, I'm just gonna call you Steve D. Uh, Steve's here every week. Thanks Steve for being with us, raising his hand. Awesome, thanks for being with us. All right, Jeff, oh, I love this question. Here we go. This is one of those fun ones. Is a protein skimmer a necessity to control nitrates? Great question. All right, so those of you who don't know, protein skimmer is a vessel where we inject air and water. Large organic molecules get stuck on the top of the air bubbles. The air bubbles float up to the top of the skimmer, they pop and they discharge those large organic molecules into the skimmer cup. A well-run skimmer should give you iced tea or darker skimmate. It's probably gonna smell a little bit. That means it's doing its job. Do you have to have a skimmer to control nitrates? Not necessarily, Jeff. Look, on my tank, my nitrates just hit one part per million, which isn't bad. Some people would like to see it up around five parts per million. In fact, if my tank went to five, I'd be okay with it. So could I turn that skimmer off and still keep my nitrates down? Probably. How am I doing that? Partially by not overfeeding, partially not by overstocking. So you could understock your tank, massively understock your tank, and then you're not gonna have any nitrates because you don't have that much nutrients going into your tank. And look, most people aren't real thrilled about getting a saltwater tank and not having that many fish in it. I realize there's some reef junkies with us tonight that are like, fish, whatever, I'm more into coral. Here's a hint, your corals will do better if you have fish in your tank, and really the more of them, as long as you're not jamming your nutrients up really high. So you could have under, you could understock your tank, Jeff, and get away without a skimmer. There's other things that per se you could do if you had a big enough refugium, you might not need a protein skimmer to control your nitrates. However, I like protein skimmers for a lot of reasons besides just nitrate control. One of them is they do a good job of help clearing up your water. On my tank, I didn't run a skimmer for several months. And when I turned it on, I noticed that my water was a lot cleaner. Also, they inject a good amount of oxygen into your water because its job is to take bubbles, smash them up, make lots of little bubbles so it oxygenates your water. One of the biggest reasons I like protein skimmers is, Jeff, it lets me know what's going on with my tank. If my skimmate goes from really dark to really light or really light to really dark, that's a cue to me that something's going on. Whether it be something died, 
and was getting decomposed in the tank, the skimmer was picking up the load, okay, then I can go on the hunt and see, hey, is something missing, something trapped, did I overfeed? All of this is cues and the protein skimmer gives me uh, the cues on that. So I like them, you don't have to have one, but they really help and they're useful for lots of other reasons. Um, so there you go. Harrison, Harrison says, thanks for the win. Harrison, I'm assuming you won as part of our 10th year anniversary that we had going on last week. Uh, congratulations on that. Congratulations to all the winners uh, who were part of the 10 year anniversary last week that ended last Sunday. Uh, if you missed that, I don't know how you missed that. We send an email just about every day. We're all over uh, social media about it. So Harrison, thanks for shopping with us. Congrats. Hopefully you won something fun uh, and useful. Amber is saying hello from Tennessee. Hey, Amber, that's home for me. Certainly I miss home and my tank when I'm on the road as well as the family. All right. <clears throat> Let's see, what other questions do we have? All right. Edible cactus. Hmm. Is that like prickly pear? I've been looking into the re Relassi LED lights. Uh, I've been told these can grow SPS and LPS. Do you know anything about these? Never heard of them edible. Uh, one thing about LEDs, it's like every two months there's another LED brand on the market. Some of them may le be legit, some of them may not, but I always sit there and I wait and I give it at least a year and I say, is this brand still around? Then if they are still around, that's good. Are they based in the US? Do I have to email the black hole and get support? Is there no support? Whenever a new LED light comes out for a new, especially a new manufacturer, I'm always on the sidelines waiting because I'm waiting for them to fall off because I've seen at least three dozen LED manufacturers come and go over the years. So I don't get excited when any new one uh, comes out. All right, let's see. Drama D, maybe the home office can answer this one because I'm not up on this. Can you purchase the gyre tank mounting magnet separately? Uh, let's, I'll get home office to in, chime in on that one. I don't know if you can buy just the gyre magnets without the gyres. All right. X, plastic X, awesome. What's the best way to clean the probes on the Apex? All right, one easy way you can clean them is just to get a soft toothbrush and scrub them off. A lot of times that's all they need. I found sponge material. Sometimes sponges will actually start growing in there. Other organics will build up on them. All you gotta do is just brush them off gently under your tank's water and they're good to go. If you really wanted to clean the probes, there's probe cleaning solution that Hannah sells. I found most of the time you don't need it. One thing that I do with my probes, once a year, I just replace them. It's not that expensive, especially for as much as I'm relying on those probes. If they don't calibrate, I'll replace them most of the time and just after a year, I'm like, what the heck? It's just preventative maintenance. I'll just go ahead and uh, replace them, by the way. Hey, look, another Tennessean. Wow, all the Tennesseans show up when I'm out of town. I guess that's cool. Maybe y'all are celebrating me being out of the state. All right. Okay. I'm dosing nitrate with no skimmer. That works too. Oh, look at this. My buddy Vossen. So John wants to know, any experience with the Vossen larva trap? You have clowns laying uh, eggs every two weeks. Congrats on that, John. It's fun to watch clownfish lay eggs. Um, now, you want to go catch the fry. I have never used the Voss and larva trap because I've never tried to raise uh, larvae or fry fish. I've heard it works very well. Lots of uh, aquaculture facilities and captive breeders use it. Uh, so I would recommend it from their feedback on it. And it comes from my buddy Chad who does legit stuff. Certainly the, va the Voss and larval trap uh, is famous. Even you know about it, John. So if you can grab one, certainly jump on there and uh, do it. Hmm. All right. Dustin wants to know, here's a fun one. How can you have cyano and GHA and Corlin growing at the same time? How to fix it that won't harm my tank or chato. Nitrates and phosphates are in range. You win row of phos. All right. A couple things. Corlin algae isn't bad. Some people don't like it. They don't like the look, which is like to each their own. I like the look. It just started showing up in my tank. However, if you have coral and algae in your tank, other than you not liking how it looks, it's nothing to get concerned about. It's not something that I would worry about and be like, oh no, there's coralline. To me, it's more like, okay, the tank's maturing. 
coralline algae has not shown up. So don't even worry about the coralline. If you don't like the way it looks, scrape it off. Good luck trying to get it off surfaces like rocks. It's not going to happen. All right, so how can you have cyano and GHA? First thing to keep in mind is cyanobacteria is a bacteria. Green hair algae is an algae. Two different organisms, totally different things. Cyanobacteria has been around forever, forever, forever. It even grows in the desert where there's hardly any water. So the fact that you have it in your saltwater tank, it's like perfect breeding grounds for cyano. You've got light, you've got a lot of moisture, and you probably got some amount of nutrients. Even if you don't see the nutrients on a test kit, they're still there. No wonder it's gonna show up. Now, how can you have that and GHA? Because it's two different things. But the GHA is gonna eat up some nutrients. Sometimes if it eats up too much nutrients, then the cyano can pop up if things get out of whack. If you have both, to me, it's not like you should, if you have one, then you're not gonna have the other. It's not uncommon to see them pop up at the same time. Cyano is fairly easy to get rid of. The first thing I do is I siphon it off. As much as you can siphon off, get rid of it. You don't wanna just scrape it off because then it blows around your tank. You want to, you can scrape it, but then you wanna siphon it out to get it out of your tank. I get out as much as I can, then I turn the lights off for three days. Three days of no lights aren't gonna hurt your fish. It's not gonna hurt your coral. The cyano very likely died during that time. When you turn the lights back on, here's the key. You gotta do a large water change to take those nutrients out. All that cyano has just died. There's still some kind of cyano in there, even if you can't see it. You turn the lights back on, all of a sudden you give them the light they need. They've got nutrients, bam, it's gonna show back up. And the three days of darkness were also should, should put a dent in your hair, hair algae. That should at least weaken it. You can pull it out at that point. You can siphon it off. You don't want to just leave it to die unless you have really good nutrient export because it's just going to kick up nutrients in your tank and cause the issue all over again. Keep in mind, if your nitrates and your phosphates are too low, that can cause cyano and hair algae and if they're too high. We did a webinar with Dr. Tim from Dr. Tim Aquatics about a year ago now uh, during the lockdowns where we talked about that. Go check that out, Dustin. That will dive into it way more than I can uh, in a short Q&A session. Oh, good. Here's a fun one. Um, I'll probably get hammered for this. Louisiana Bowman wants to know, is there a good hang on back skimmer to start with until I get the money to set up your tank with a big skimmer under it, i.e. in a sump? All right, Louisiana. My experience with hang on back skimmers is none of them work that great. Some of them work okay, but none of them really work that well. So really pick one. Don't expect much out of it. It may do something, but it's probably not going to do much. If it was my tank, I would just understock the tank, do some water changes, save your money up for a big skimmer and a sump because you're going to be happier that way. One, having a sump with all the equipment underneath your tank. And two, it's just going to run better anyway. Great question. Mark wants to know, so he says he's starting a new 20 gallon tank with half sand from established tank and half new dry sand. Same with rock, half established, half dry. Should you still expect a cycle? Potentially, probably not, Mark. Depends on how long that sand was uh, out of the water or out of circulation. If you had some die off with that when you moved it over, that could cause a cycle. Same with your rock, really, especially with your rock. If you had any kind of die off on the rock when you transported it, that could kick into a cycle. But most of your nitrifying bacteria lives on rocks, so you're probably going to be fine. It's not going to hurt you if you wanted to bomb some nitrifying bacteria in there. I like Dr. Tim's one and only. It's not going to hurt anything. You can't overdose nitrifying bacteria just to be safe, especially if you're going um, to be adding fish in as well. So not going to hurt anything to do that. Maybe you'll see a cycle, maybe you won't. Great question. Um, let's roll out to the next one. Oh, and congrats on the new tank. Hopefully it's an upgrade for you. One of my favorite reasons to start a new saltwater tank is to um, upgrade. James DVB, I just almost said wanted to say James DVD. My favorite overflow setup for low maintenance, which is his first priority and quiet priority too. You're considering a pair of Maggie mufflers on your new 120 with internal overflow. All right, James, I used the Maggie mufflers on our 120 build, the Mega Matrix 120. They work great. You shouldn't hear much out of them. If you are hearing a lot of noise, 
then you're likely pushing too much flow through your overflow. Common mistake people make is they feel like they need to rip water through their system. You really don't. I'm fine if I get one times uh, my system turnover, volume turnover through the sump an hour. That's fine by me. So on our mega matrix tank, we were not running a lot of flow through the overflow and I could not hear the Maggie muffers, especially when the canopy was down. Love those things. They work great. All right. Ismail wants to know, what's the best way to dose calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium? Look, Ismail, the easiest way to do it is with dosing. You dose, you mix up solutions, or you buy pre-made solutions of calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium. You buy a dosing pump or three single-head dosing pumps, and you dose them that way. Super easy, easy thing to monitor, not that hard to set up. We've got a range of dosing pumps over at saltwateraquarium.com um, from standalone ones that are Wi-Fi, something a little more complex like the Neptune System Dose that require an Apex to run to three or four channel standalone dosers. All of those work. All of them will work fine. Easiest way for you to dose in uh, calcium, magnesium, and alkalinity. All right. Great question. Do, 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 uh, Hmm. Let's see here. Hmm, sorry, just reading through questions here. Ah, here's a fun question. P wants to know, you're moving from a 55 gallon tank to a 210 reef ready. There you go, right there. Pete, I love this. If you're gonna do an upgrade, make sure it's worthwhile. Like going from a 75 to a 90, there's nothing wrong with a 90 gallon tank, but like make it worth your effort. Upgrading saltwater tanks isn't the easiest thing in the world. I didn't say it's not fun, but it takes a fair amount of effort. So if you're going to do it, make it worth your while. Pete here is going from 55 gallons, the tank that everyone's had, to 210 gallons. That's a nice upgrade. It's going to feel like a big tank. Your fish are going to act differently in the new tank, Pete, if you're carrying your fish over. Um, awesome. So pumped for your upgrade. Your question is, do I need to move the livestock as soon as I have the tank running? Ideally, Pete, you would have the tanks in separate places. There's this again. Separate places so that you can set up your new tank, get it going, and then slowly bring stuff over from your 55. This way, you have, per se, all the time in the world. You don't have to be in a rush because you're thinking about the fish that you've got in holding containers or coral in holding containers about the 55 is down. It gives you flexibility. Because one thing that goes about with tank builds, and it even happened today with this tank build, you're going to forget something. Something's not going to go as planned. It's going to take longer than you think. So by having two separate systems, then you've given yourself the option of time. You can build up your 210 as you have time and then move over once the tank is ready. One mistake that I see a lot of people make when they're moving livestock from one tank to another one or setting up a new tank is they go too fast. Look, your tank is new. It needs some time to get its legs under itself, so to speak. Giving it time isn't going to hurt it. If you take six months to move everything over, it's not going to hurt your tank. Now, look, let's keep it in perspective. If you're moving over two Chromis or like two tangs from a 55 to a 210, you don't have to wait six months to do it. Like your tank is going to need some nutrients and some stuff in it, so you don't have to wait forever. But if you spread these things out and you go slower when you're stocking up a new tank, I found those tanks always do better. I've had some clients who just haven't had successful tanks and one trend I've seen with them is they added too much too fast. So if you can have time, Pete, where you can have your 55 up and add your 210, look, add some fish when you get your 210 up and running to help cycle the tank. Now I cycle the tank with Dr. Tim's one and only Natch Fine bacteria. Let's say you had a pair of clownfish, dump in the bacteria, put in the clowns. The next day you might see one nitrates. The cycle happens nearly instantly. You can't overdose the nitrifying bacteria and know it doesn't stress the fish at all. Then move livestock um, over as you have time. So you need something to get the tank going. Like put in your, say you've got those two clowns, put those starter fish in, wait a week, make sure your nutrients are staying down, then add some more tanks, some more fish into your new tank, get it going. Because remember your tank needs some kind of nutrients in there if you just leave it barren, I'm not a fan of that because your tank needs some nutrients, needs some poop, and needs some stuff to get going. 
just leaving it bearing to me is in helping your tank get its legs under itself um, and help itself get going. All right. Daniel wants to know, should power heads be on 24 seven? I did a quick tip about this a couple weeks ago, Daniel. Do they have to be on? No, I actually like to turn off my power heads sometime during the day for a couple of reasons. One, it changes fish behavior. It's interesting. Some fish get more aggressive that were passive. The fish also start to spread out. They also will go into areas that they couldn't get to because your power heads are on. Sometimes they'll actually get down in the power head and clean off all the algae on it because they can't get there when the flow is on. Now, I said that once and someone's like, oh, that's bad because that's going to teach your fish that they can go get into the power head. If your power head's running, the fish can't get in it. They're not purposely going to dive into that high a flow. They probably can't get through that much flow. So you don't have to worry about that. So they don't have to be on 24 seven, Daniel. As I said in the quick tip, actually like turning them off, especially during the day, watch your tank spread, your fish spread out more in the tank, watch their behaviors change and watch them go to work in new areas of your tank. It's pretty fun to do that. Uh huh. Wow. Okay, here's a fun one. A little different question for me tonight. Emerald Coast Reef Head from Crestview, Florida. I've been keeping my first saltwater tank for six months now, and I'm looking to start my own YouTube channel on my reef tank. Hmm, brings back memories. What would you recommend for a beginner? All right, Emerald, um, I should clarify that. What are you talking about? Fish, are you talking about YouTube advice? Clarify that one for me, and, and I'll jump back um, cord towards that um at the end of the stream so go ahead and claim i want to know what you're looking for advice on whether it be youtube or your tank um let's see oh here's a good question what equipment would you recommend to never buy second hand hmm. let me think on that one for a minute that's a good one Okay, um, so it's not really equipment, but I wouldn't buy sand. I would not buy sand out of one tank to put it in another tank. There's a lot of stuff that's junk in this, that's stuck in the sand. If you rinse it out enough to get rid of that junk, you're probably gonna kill all the good stuff in the sand. Sand I wouldn't buy secondhand. Rock, I'm probably not gonna buy secondhand either, mainly because I don't know what kind of life that rock has had. Does the tank have high nutrients? Therefore, the rock could be full of nutrients. Does the rock have a fish disease in it? So I always start my, new, my tanks with fresh rock and fresh sand. Now that's not necessarily equipment. So what would I never buy secondhand, equipment wise? So there's some great, some leeway on this one. So let me qualify this. A tank I'm iffy on buying secondhand, assuming it's been up and set up and run for a while, a while being at least a couple of years. Look, if the tank's been up a year and you wanna buy it, not a problem. If the tank's never been set up and you're buying it secondhand, okay, I'm not worried about that. Someone who's giving you a super wicked deal on a tank that's been up 10 years, okay, I'm gonna be concerned about that, especially, especially if they tell you that they moved that tank several times. And then if they tell me they moved it a couple times and kept everything in it when they moved it, I'm not, the conversation's over. I'm out the door. I'm no way I'm going to touch that tank. So an older tank, I would not buy secondhand, especially if it's been moved. It's just not worth it. The last thing between all the water in the tank and the floor is the silicone seals. Over time, those things age. So an older tank, I'm not going to buy secondhand. It's just not worth it. No matter how nice your equipment is, if the tank fails, you've got major problems. Your relationship may not even survive that. It's simply not worth it. Great question. Uh, let's see here. We got time for a couple more. Let's see if my buddy has, uh, oh, look at that. Um, answered a question about his YouTube channel because he was asking me about that. And that's a kind of a uh, off topic, gen different, um, question that um, then we usually get. Let me see if he answered that. Maybe he, oh, so in the meantime, this is a fun one that I love about starting corals 
for your tank. What are some great starter for Carter? Starter corals, ha! Uh, for a 75 gallon that's refreighting the fish have been thriving for months. All right, so starter corals, there's lots of them. One thing I like to do for starter corals on tanks is put in a variety. The, the starter corals are canaries in a coal mine. You can't look at a tank and be like, okay, now it's ready for corals. Like, does it help if it's been established for a couple months, a couple weeks, a couple months? Probably, but it's not like you could do a water test and there's something that pops up in this water test and it goes, oh, boom, here's the magic bullet. This tank is ready for corals. But the best thing that I do is I get the tank up and running, get it through its initial cycle, wait two weeks, make sure everything's stable. Then I put in some corals. And as I said, I put in a mix, put in some soft corals, put in some LPS, put in some hardy SPS, like the purple milk of stylo. I've had that in all my tanks and it's never slowed down, like ever. No matter what happened with the tank, that SPS doesn't stop. So put in your SPS, put in a couple hardy LPS, put in some hardy softies, and then see what happens. Wait and watch. Keep your tank stable, get into your routine, and see what happens. Maybe the SPS dies. Okay, something else I would do is I wouldn't just put in one SPS. I'd put in two, two or three. It might be that that coral wasn't going to make it anyway. So if you just put in one and it died, you'd be like, oh, my tank's not ready for SPS. Not necessarily. You're having a couple of this one type of coral. If they all die, okay, now I'm going to be more curious about things. I'll be more cautious towards that type. Maybe they all take off. Great. Give it a month. Be cautious. Give it a month. Then put some more in and see what you get. See how those do. Really, you just have to put some stuff in there. See if the canary lives in the coal mine. Then put in some more canaries. And then see how things get going. That's exactly what I did on my 1,000-gallon reef. Put in some SPS. Put in the purple milk of stylo. Put in some LPS. Put in some softies. And then I just wait. I gave it a couple weeks, watched how those corals did, watched my tank parameters, make sure everything is up and running and stable. Then I put in more, they did well, then I just start putting more and more in as I'm building confidence in the tank. And the tank is telling me that it's getting up uh, and rolling. Uh, great question uh, on that one. Speaking of corals, blend the night with our buddy Steve D, who's with us every week. Steve, thanks for being, you know what? Steve, you're with us every week. Um, I'm going to add a $25 gift certificate to your saltwaterquarium.com account. It's on me to the home office. So make sure uh, you email us, sales at saltwaterquarium.com. Let, uh, let, let them know that I said that and we'll add it to your account. So Steve wants to know, does the old school bright yellow Tonga leather, also known as the Fiji leather, get imported anymore? Do I see it when I'm diving? Oh man, when I'm in Fiji, I see tons of that stuff. I've been in fields and fields of the Fiji leathers, the yellow Fijis. They're all over the place. I see them come in from time to time. You know, Fiji's coral imports have kind of, they started and then they stopped. Uh, and I heard they're going to start again. Maybe they were. So it's around. You'd probably have to buy it captive red, so to speak, or aquacultured. Um, I see them sometimes come in, but it's certainly not as frequent. Look, they're not necessarily in favor. Like, 20, 30 years ago, it was like, oh, if you could keep that coral alive, you were like some kind of reefing deity. Uh, not necessarily the prettiest coral in the world, but it's certainly fun to see in a tank, and it's fun to see uh, in the ocean. So with that, Steve, thanks for being with us. Thanks, everyone, for being with us. We'll be back Monday night. So next Monday night, I'm actually slated to be home. I'll be home in front of my 1,000-gallon reef. Be with us at the usual time, Monday at 7 p.m. Central. Thanks, everyone, for being with us. Have a great rest of your week. Enjoy your tanks, and we'll catch you next Monday night.